Well, good evening, and thank you all for coming out this evening uh, to join me and Joel Simon, who is the executive director of the Committee to Protect Journalists. Um, some of you know that I, too, for most of my career, was a foreign correspondent, so this is uh, an exceptional pleasure for me to be here uh, and to uh, conduct this conversation, uh, because I look at Joel as not only a colleague, but also an insurance policy. So I am uh, <laughs> very happy to be on stage with you and for you to get to know me by and know my face should anything ever <laughs> happen to me. You don't want to get the call from the committee to protect journalists. So. And and th and thankfully, you have never received the call from me and uh, or from my family. Um, you know, it, it's uh, so I want to talk about the C mm. CPJ, the mm. Committee to Protect Journalists. Mm -hmm. uh, we in the journalism profession often refer to it with its acronym. Yeah. Um, and why is it, for instance, there is a committee to protect journalists, uh, especially, you know, and not a committee to protect CEOs or a committee to protect, um, I don't know, uh, bakers? Yeah. I mean, what is it that makes journalists exceptionally vulnerable and, uh, and also targeted? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's worth sort of telling the story of how, how CPJ started, yeah. and then we can sort of back up and talk about, you know, why, you know, the particular role that, that journalists play and why, um, why we as an organization have this, 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 this special and, and critical mission. So, really, CPJ started in, in the 1980s, kind of with the birth of the human rights movement. And at that time, there was a, a, a group of US journalists who came together, and they recognized that their colleagues around the world were facing uh, uh, you know, uh, violence and repression. And uh, there was actually a specific incident that led to the creation of the Committee to Protect Journalists. There was a Paraguayan journalist who was actually visiting the United States and learned that he would be arrested if he went home to Paraguay. And he was meeting with American journalists, and he told this story, and the journalists were like, what can we do? And uh, he was like, cover it. And at the time, you know, international, you know, sort of foreign correspondents focused, it really didn't cover human rights issues, particularly attacks on journalists. There was a kind of sense of special pleading. Anyway, this guy went back to Paraguay, he was arrested, there was a flurry of international news coverage, he was released, and from that single incident, this model emerged of journalists defending journalists, um, using the tools of journalism to do that. Why do we do it? Um, journalists play a unique and critical role, not only informing in, informing their own societies, but there's kind of a, a global information ecosystem. And so if journalists in country X are being persecuted, that only has, ha has a profound impact on the ability of the people of that society to hold their leaders accountable, to uh, participate in the political life of the country. It actually undermines the whole global information system. Um, so you know, we believe that, that um, you know, historically, and we're, we're living in a different era now, but, but historically American journalists have worked from a position of privilege. And so the ability of the U.S. media to mobilize on behalf of um, uh, colleagues around the world who are much more vulnerable um, was kind of the raison d'etre of, of the Committee to Protect Journalists. Well, thank you, first mm -hmm. of all, for doing the work that you do and for looking out for our colleagues around the world. And, uh, you intimated, of course, that the United States maybe does no longer hold yeah, this yeah. Uh, this privileged position. But uh, but do you ever, as the CPJ, also look at the unique role that journalism plays in the not strictly in the guarantee of free information flow, but also in uh, a, a much more decidedly political role, which is in defending those systems that allow for freedom of expression and freedom of opinion. In other words, do you see it as a institution that is uh, supportive of a liberal democratic orientation. I mean, it, it's yeah, a... Yes, I do, but, but you know, that, that is actually not... I mean, I think we're defending something much more basic. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't think, you know, obviously, you know, I have a personal interest and stake in, you know, preserving and defending liberal democracy, but that's not really the purpose of CPJ. That we're, you know, the, the, the fundamental right that we're defending is consecrated and articulated in international law. And in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you know, the, the drafted in 1948, the specific language, the framework that defends the rights of all people everywhere to seek and receive information regardless of frontiers. That's how it's expressed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there are much more authoritarian or, or, or um, uh, structures where the media has some 
um, ability to operate with independence. And that, you know, that is, you know, that's certainly not liberal democracy, but we're still going to defend that space. Right. Um, and, and we're really not necessarily focused on outcomes in terms of, you know, is, is a society, you know, moving towards a more sort of traditional liberal structure. We're really defending the rights of individual journalists to practice their craft uh, under the rubric of international law. So if that's uh, the wider mission, how do you then distinguish yourself, or maybe you mm -hmm. collaborate with other organizations that are really ho human rights oriented that also work towards the defense of this universal declaration? I'm thinking specifically of a of human, rights, human watch. rights watch. Yes, of course. So um, it sounds like there may be some parallels or uh, collaboration well, or... Well, Human Rights Watch... Uh, was created at the same time as the Committee to Protect Journalists. We actually so were, were an offshoot of, of Human Rights Watch. So, um, so in, in the 1980s, the period I described, Arye Nair, who was the sort of godfather of the American human rights movement, you know, created Helsinki Watch, which was, you know, the purpose of which was to kind of ensure that, you know, the, 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 the Helsinki Accords were respected in the Soviet Union. And he had a vision of the broader human rights movement, which was that professionals, lawyers, journalists, doctors even, would form their own groups to defend the rights of their colleagues around the world. And that was actually the genesis of, of CPJ. So we, we actually sort of were housed in the headquarters of, 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 of Human Rights Watch uh, when we first started. But we've, you know, and we still work very closely with Human Rights Watch. Uh, for example, in the Khashoggi uh, um, uh, um, uh, advocacy around the Khashoggi murder, Jamal Khashoggi, the, um, a Saudi journalist who was murdered and dis dismembered in the, uh, in the Saudi consulate in, in Istanbul. So we are, we are working with Human Rights Watch calling for a UN-led international investigation. But, but we really are very careful to defend the central um, uh, uh, the central framework that, that, that really embodies our mandate, press freedom. We really don't get out of our lane. We don't defend broader human rights. We defend the rights of journalists, and we defend press freedom. Right. Uh, well, you just brought up Khashoggi and yeah. Jamal Khashoggi, who we should also add was a columnist for the yeah. Washington Post yes. and a resident of the United States, which complicates things for the U.S. government, of course, in that mm -hmm. um, we have a very different message coming from the White House than we do from yeah. CPJ, for instance. Um, but using that particular case, and, and maybe just so you can give us some historical mm. perspective, are things getting worse or are they getting better or about the same? I mean, are we sort mm -hmm. of seeing a greater assault on journalism? Yes. Are we su sensing that? Uh, certainly, I think we're more than sensing it. We're, yeah. we're seeing it. We're, we're, we're able to, to see it in our data. So one of the things that CPJ does every year, as I mentioned, we're an organization of journalists. And so we, you know, we do journalism. That's kind of the, the, the way in which we carry out our advocacy. And we document uh, the number of journalists who are imprisoned around the world each year, a number of journalists who are killed, for example. And over the last three years, we've seen record numbers of journalists uh, Im imprisoned around the world. The actual spike, interestingly enough, goes back to um, the period following um, uh, the September 11th attacks, mm -hmm. when um, uh, the, the, the onset of the war on terror, when this new framing was developed, you know, of, of um, you know, you're with us or you're against us, and, and you know, um, uh, the kind of, you know, the, the kind of reframing of um, repression as anti-terror. And so journalists were swept up in that. We saw a spike in, in, in journalists in prison around the world. That has continued. And now under Trump, we have a new f framework for global repression, which is cracking down on fake news. So you see autocrats around the world basically appropriate the kind of rhetoric that you see uh, being used in the United States and, in, and, and using that to justify their repression. So um, you know, that's one of the things we're seeing. And you know, just getting back to the Khashoggi uh, killing, you know, I mean, there are so many um, there are so many reasons why that was a you know a seminal murder. I mean, just the the the, the you know for those who, I think most people are familiar with the crime. You know, he was as you mentioned a Washington Post uh, columnist. He become um, you know he was a sort of um, 
uh, uh, you could call him a sort of uh, somebody who played ball uh, yeah. in Saudi Arabia and you know supported the monarchy, but then he became disaffected after um, uh, Mohammed bin Salman was named Crown Prince. He left the country. He started working for the Washington Post, um, and for whatever reason, he was targeted. He went to the um, consulate um, in Istanbul, and a hit team that was sent from Riyadh, um, intelligence indicates on the orders of Mohammed bin Salman. Um, murdered him, and what has been completely um, uh, just, just, just um, uh, really disorienting is to see the response of, of, of President Trump um, to this to this murder of a U.S. Uh, resident, a columnist for the Washington Post, murdered by a U.S. ally. His intelligence services has indicated that this was a, a state crime. And he's put out this bizarre White House statement basically saying, you know, the truth is unknowable and, um, uh, you know, and he's, he's made arguments that, you know, the, the kind of com commercial relationship with Saudi Arabia, the strategic relationship with Saudi Arabia, Trump's concerns about press freedom of the rights of journalists. I think this, you know, is disheartening for yes. those of us who have defended press freedom of the rights of journalists, and it sends an absolutely terrible message uh, to countries around the world that engage in repressive and violent action against the press. Yeah, it's horrific, and yeah. uh, and the yeah. fact that he's actually making a cost-benefit analysis almost in real time yeah. as I he's mean, thinking about this. Yeah, that's, the that, that's, yes, we're, we're, we're actually privy to, um, you know, what, what might have been uh, a, a maybe a somewhat uh, unpleasant a Security Council debate yes. is now sort of happening in public view inside the president's head. Yes. So it's it's completely disorienting. Right, and, and as you say, it raises is the stakes, yeah. and it yeah. certainly adds yeah. to the terror and the yeah. and the fear that yeah. uh, that the journalists and our colleagues, who are increasingly, as you say, with the numbers, increasingly under threat of a, yeah. whether assault or uh, kidnapping or right. um, or imprisonment. Um, you know, I it, it's not just these mm -hmm. particular actions. I, I as mm -hmm. I mentioned, I was a foreign correspondent. I worked for Newsweek, and yeah. um, there was a time when um, during the revolutions of Eastern Europe, yeah. I was covering the uh, Romanian Revolution, and one of the things that we made sure to do, uh, what, what, there was a, we had this habit, much like the Red yeah. Cross, we would put on our yeah. vehicles press. Exactly. Um, so, you know, yeah. often vehicles that are identified as being either humanitarian mm -hmm. right. or being press vehicles were then given some little, some special privilege. Oftentimes you could get beyond police lines or any number of other things. Well, it was the worst possible thing we could have done in Romania because uh, that meant shoot me, in essence, when yeah. you had uh, press on, because the Securitate was trying to protect right, right. Ceausescu. And in fact, I was the person who ended up getting the call. Uh, I had to call for John Tagliabu, mm -hmm. who was the New York mm -hmm. Times correspondent. I had to call the New York Times desk to inform them of their corresponding being shot uh, in one of these cars that had been, um, had been so marked. Um, so it's not just these things of, of actually, you know, a targeting of somebody who individual, but you can actually have these random targets just by dint of being identified as being pressed. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think what's interesting, so I mean, this can sort of lead us into the conversation about yeah. kidnapping, but you know, okay, there, th in this particular circumstance, you know, putting press on your vehicle or identifying yourself as a journalist didn't protect you. But in, in many other circumstances, it did. Yes. And that was because journalists collectively exercised a kind of information monopoly. And even if you were a criminal group or you were a, um, uh, you know, a, 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 a militant group of some sort, if you wanted to communicate with a mass audience, you needed to use the press. You yes. had to engage with the media. And so when journalists got into scrapes or when they were working in a dangerous environment, you know, they, they, they thought that identifying themselves as a journalist would invite some protection. And there were certainly instances of journalists being kidnapped. It, you know, this, this system was not foolproof. We know about Terry Anderson, yes. of course, the AP bureau chief who was kidnapped in Beirut by Islamic Jihad, uh, you know, the Hezbollah offshoot, and held for almost seven years. Uh, so, so these incidents were not unprecedented. But we've seen an explosion of kidnapping really uh, following, um, you know, 9-11. Uh, and there's a sp specific incident that really, I think, triggered this. And that was um, the murder of Daniel Pearl, the Wall Street yes. Journal correspondent who was kidnapped in, and beheaded in, in, in Pakistan soon after 9-11. Uh, and um, back that, you know, you'll, you, some of you will recall that when, when, when Osama bin Laden um, uh, declared jihad on the United States, he actually held a press conference 
You know, he invited right. journalists yeah. and he sat them down and he had a press conference. So journalists, you know, covered Osama bin yes. Laden. They engaged with him. You know, they, they knew he was doing bad things, but they, they felt a certain level of safety and security engaging with him because he had indicated that he needed them to communicate. Well, that changed yes. with uh, the Danny Pearl murder. And I was very involved in, you know, you know trying to win his release after that happened. And the strategy that we employed at the time was one that had been developed, I think, you know, in part during the Lebanon hostage crisis, which was, and, and maybe in Colombia as well, where journalists were also kidnapped, which was to, to use the media itself to humanize the victim and to apply pressure on anyone who might have influence with the kidnappers. And that was an effective strategy, except when the intention of the kidnappers from the outset is to murder the person. Yes. And actually what we did is we amplified the Al-Qaeda propaganda, and I always express it this way. Most people can't name a single person killed in the Twin Towers. They can't name a single person killed in the Pentagon, but they know Danny Pearl. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the strategy. But what it did was it also sent a message, you know, it sent a terrorizing message to journalists around the world, but it also sent a message to I Islamist and jihadi groups around the world that journalists were fair game yeah. and that there were other means of communicating. There was no longer an information monopoly. Uh, uh, technology had changed that. Um, and we saw that with Al Qaeda and we saw that reach, a, reach another level uh, with the emergence of the Islamic State. Uh, but it meant that journalists were, were, were fair game and we saw an epidemic of kidnapping you know, that started in Pakistan, spread to Somalia, spread to Iraq spread to Syria, you know, with, um, you know, incidents flaring up in other parts of the world, Philippines, et cetera. Well, you know, part of that, uh, and I don't know, I, I'm mm -hmm. curious to hear from you if mm -hmm. whether or not you believe um, that that exponential growth in the kidnapping is also uh, due in part to the fact that we're no longer as anonymous as we once were. Certainly when I was reporting um, in Eastern Europe back mm -hmm. in, the, in the days of the Cold War and, and behind the Iron Curtain, I would often enter a country and my visa would say that I was a teacher because they weren't welcoming journalists at the mm -hmm. time. And mm -hmm. so um, I would go about my business of collecting mm -hmm. information, mm -hmm. I would get my byline and there would not be a photo of me anywhere uh, that they could refer to or really it would be very difficult for them to even get my clips uh, because they didn't have access yeah. to the types of, of um, the ubiquitous information yeah. that exists now about me. I mean, you can go online now and yeah, you can well, find I out mean, what my children's names I are. Mean, so, I, I mean, I yes. think it works both ways. I mean, I've seen a lot of incidents, a lot, where journalists have been kidnapped and the kidnappers do a Google search. And they're, you know, they're, they're, they're saying, you know, I'm a journalist. And they're like, no, you're a spy. And they do a Google search and they find clips and they're like, okay, you're a journalist, and they let them go. Uh -huh. So, I mean, you know, it kind of works both, and it's, it's very pedestrian, and they're, you know, and they're just like, you know, they're, they're reading the articles, right. and they're like evaluating them, and sometimes they, you know, if they're... Criticizing if them. They, yeah, <laughs> yes. they're critiquing them. Yes. If they're, but I, I, I've talked to <laughs> a lot know. of journalists who've been in that situation where they've been de detained by some militant group, yeah. and they just pull them into some house, and they Google their, their articles, and they read them. Um, it is true that, yes, you're more visible now, and uh, but, you know, I, when I look at, um, you know, and, and, and the, one of the things I think we'll get into in the book is yeah. how incomplete the data is, yes. but just based on my conversations that I've had with journalists, very rarely are they targeted. You know, it's really, for the most part, it's a crime of opportunity. So, you know, as a journalist, think, you know, Danny Pearl is the example. You know, he was reporting, yeah. and in order to do his job, he had to engage with groups that, you know, were shadowy militant groups. They realized, you know, that this was an opportunity. That's the way a lot of kidnappings of journalists happen, or they're just driving down a the road, they're pulled over, they get to a checkpoint. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but in my research, I didn't uncover too many uh, instances uh, where a specific journalist was targeted uh, as a result of, of, of their you know, visibility. Well, that's good because I've been avoiding Turkey because oh. of what I've been writing about well, them, and I'm well, sure they know uh, what I look I'm, like. I'm not, I'm not saying they haven't been arrested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might, you might get arrested. So I see, okay, yeah, but yeah, not so kidnapped. Not okay, kidnapped. well, we got, yeah. All right, yeah. well, that is... That helps me. Yeah. But you know, since we, we should talk a bit about yeah. kidnapping, yeah. because this is yeah. the yeah. focus of your book, and yeah. the title of it is We Want to Negotiate. Yeah. And it, that phrase comes out of an email that was sent right. after the James Foley yeah. kidnapping, and you had a personal uh, connection yeah. to this particular kidnapping. Uh, and 
if I may frame your, yeah. your argument, it is that there are some countries that are willing to negotiate. We hear about these mm -hmm. uh, regularly. France and Spain are sort of the ones we yep. think about in general. There are other countries that say we don't negotiate with terrorists. We will never negotiate for hostages, and they include the United States and yep. the UK. Yep. And you go through a very um, detailed research project here to yep. really uncover what where the truth lies, where there is data, and, 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 and come up with essentially three areas in which we make these arguments and understanding. One is an ethical one, yeah. another one is the political one, yeah. and the final one is the policy right. orientation. And so maybe you can walk us through kind of the, I know it's such a, it's such a big uh, thing, I'm not gonna come to yeah. your conclusion, yeah. because I think yeah. it's, it's Im uh, I'll let you uh, well, express well, you that. Well, you know what I, I, would, I, would, I would like to do if, if you'll indulge yeah. me? So I think I want to tell you know, how, I, how I came to yeah. this project, because, and then, and then we'll get to you know, where, where I ended up. So, I mean, I think I mentioned you know, kidnapping is an occupational hazard for, for journalists, and it's something that I've had to deal, deal with over the course of my, my time at CPJ, and in some instances we've even been involved in you know, what I would call kind of back, background, you know, back, backdoor negotiations, you know, where, where one of the demands might be, you know, to, to communicate something. So, you know, this is something that's been part of my career um, and, and sometimes a very difficult part of my career. But I had I'd never seen anything like what happened in Syria beginning in late 2012 into 2013, where the, the kind of risk environment changed so quickly that journalists and, and aid workers, and by the way, I should mention that my book starts out looking at journalists, but it broadens the discussion to, you know, more broadly, you know, the typical, you know, victims of kidnappings, whether they're journalists or not. Um, and so Westerners who were, you know, visible Westerners who were, who were operating in Syria just started disappearing. Yeah. And, you know, at first we didn't know why this was or who was taking them. Um, and eventually, you know, it, it emerged that there was this new, very radical militant group that was targeting Westerners and they were holding them and we did not know uh, for what purpose. And one of the people who disappeared, initially disappeared, was James Foley, um, a journalist who I had met. Um, he actually was very friendly, close friends with some people on our staff, so we were, you know, we were very concerned. Um, uh, but, you know, we didn't really know who had him or why or why they were holding him. Uh, and eventually his family um, decided to go public. Um, they got this ransom note from the kidnappers that said, you know, this was after months. It was, more, it was actually more than almost a year um, that they held him without communicating. And they sent this note saying, we want to negotiate. Um, and the U.S., as you mentioned, had a policy of... Um, uh, no concessions, and so the family uh, at one point was actually threatened with uh, prosecution yes, if I they know. if they paid a ransom. And they were they were so desperate that they came to me, and they said, you know, we need your help um, to raise a ransom. Right. And I was confronted with a really difficult, you know, question. You know, first of all, I wanted to help. Of course I wanted to help. Who, who wouldn't want to help in this situation? But I was worried about, you know, the legal risk to me, to yeah. my organization. Um, and I also was concerned that, you know, if we supported the payment of a ransom, even for this, you know, journalist of who, of course, we wanted back, it would actually increase the risk that other journalists would be um, would be kidnapped. Right, and that's one of the arguments that's often the used, arguments. right, is yeah. that if you pay these people off, right. and this enters right. into the ethical question, of course, if you pay them off, you're just underwriting their activities. Well, that's right. And so, so after Jim Foley was killed, Diane Foley, Jim's mother, came to me and said, you know, we had a sort of heart-to-heart -heart about this. And she said, well, this is the, the logical supposition, but how do you know it? Right. And I said, you know, kind of as a journalist, I, I don't really know it. That's kind of like the thing as a journalist where you really have to test your ideas. Yes. And I sort of felt, and no one was willing to do this because it's just a third rail. Yes. Know, of course you can't pay <laughs> ransom to terrorists. So I just said, you know, I kind of owe it to the family, and I'm going to take this on. And so that's it. So I went to France. I went to Spain. I talked to all these, you know, these experts, and I talked to the families, I talked to the intelligence, uh, um, people worked in intelligence, I talked to the professional negotiators, this whole world of kidnapping and ransom insurance, and I found that a couple of the central premises didn't hold up. The first one is that if you pay ransom, more people will be kidnapped, and that's incredibly logical, as I, as I mentioned, but there's been some studies done and there's really very little data to support it. And what I found out in 
as well in the United States, it was an accidental policy. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, R Richard Nixon sort of blurted it out in response to a hostage crisis that was, took place in, 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 um, in Khartoum in Sudan in 1973. There were some American diplomats taken hostage. He said we wouldn't negotiate, and they shot the, t shot the hostages immediately. Yes. And so the policy was sort of built around this pronouncement, but it really was was a political statement, right. and um, and the data you know was never really there because what I found is there's a there's a market for for kidnapping, you know, and the market is 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 created by the fact that families will pay, yes, businesses will pay. There's a whole insurance industry. It, first of all, it's legal to pay if it's a criminal group. So right. you know, there's there's a market, you know, and 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 we, the U.S. government, may distinguish between criminal groups and and terror groups, but hostage takers do not. Right. So you know, basically, what I found is there's no data to support the, or very little data to support the contention that not paying actually reduces the risk of future kidnappings because it's largely a crime of opportunity. Uh, so that basic that pretense, you know, that 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 whole underlying principle really collapsed. Uh, when I started looking more closely at the data and talking to the experts. Yeah, and what happens then when it becomes, uh, so you talk about criminal, criminal groups, yeah, for instance. Yeah. What happens when it's a nation state that actually oh, yeah, does then we the hostage taking? Oh, yeah, then we absolutely. It, it, and so that is the exception, really, because. Uh, well, it's not the exception. I would, I would say the, we negotiate in almost every circumstance. So if you're a member of the military yes. and you're taken prisoner, we negotiate. We yes. change prisoners. I mean, that's part of the Geneva Conventions. Um, if you're kidnapped in the United United States, by the way, um, not only will we – we don't make a distinction between terrorists and criminals. It's a rare crime. Right. Uh, but we, the U.S. government will not only negotiate, they will provide the ransom. There are ransoms stashed at Federal Reserve banks around the country, th up to $300,000, and the FBI calls this ransom as lore. They pay the ransom, they free you, and it's very easy to track ransom payments, and then they arrest the people. So that's – so if you're in the U.S., they, they, they negotiate and they pay. Um, if it's a um, if it's a plane, if a plane is hijacked, they pay. Nixon even paid uh, uh, a plane that was uh, a ransom uh, that w for a plane that was hijacked and flown to Cuba. He, it was like a, 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 an incident where he authorized the payment of two million dollars. It was driven down the tarmac. Um, we pay if it's criminals, no problem. We pay. Yeah. You know, and the government will actually help support the family's efforts yeah. to pay. So there's it's actually the opposite. There's this very special limited carve out for terror groups that are designated by the United States, then we don't negotiate, then we don't pay, uh, and the families are on their own. All right, so you've done this study, you've looked mm -hmm. at this research, you've yeah. turned it every which way, and you come to some conclusions. Um, should we then negotiate well, with terror groups? Well, let's think. Let's sort of play this out. Yeah. So, first of all, the first part of the lo the, the, the logical underpinning collapses. The second part is that it um, increases uh, the funding for these terror groups, right. and and that is obviously a much more serious argument that you really have to grapple with, and it's complex because what I found is that the European one of the reasons the Europeans pay is they've done the political math in France when. Um, somebody is kidnapped, if they're a prominent person, there are political protests, people march in the street, you know, that's kind of the French political culture and the colonial history is that the French government has to look out for its citizens when it gets in trouble abroad. The usual means they have to do that is to pay. The Spanish have made a political calculation, they will pay. The Italians, the Germans, the Swiss, the market is there. So um, at that point, if you don't, and, and the fact that the countries that pay and the countries that don't pay are on opposite sides of this divide and at loggerheads means that there isn't communication between the two and you're giving the hostages an opportunity to basically kill a hostage that has no value to put pressure on the countries that do pay and it actually increases the amount of money going to these terror groups in mm -hmm. some circumstances. So my argument is really an argument of, you know, this was an accidental policy. Yes. It's really not supported by evidence. And each host, one of the things that you hear over and over from professionals is each case is different. Right. And a terrible opening gambit in any negotiation is to say we won't negotiate. Right. So you know, even if you have no intention of paying, there's no point in announcing it. And really my argument comes down to one of redefining the problem in, in one, the first way to redefine the problem is let's not get caught up in this kind of 
ideological battle over paying or not paying. Let's acknowledge that kidnapping is a tool of war. It's existed, you know, since Helen of Troy. <laughs> it's always part of conflict. Um, it's you're not going to wipe it out. You're not going to eliminate it. Let's reduce the uh, appeal of kidnapping by working together to reduce the amount of ransom that kidnappers can collect you know, when they kidnap. So, so that's the first point. And the second point is, let's consider this issue, let's consider a, a policy of maximum flexibility. There are many circumstances where, na you know, and let's look at it fr through a national security framework. There are many circumstances which from the vantage point of national security, you can't pay. Mm -hmm. But there may be others where it actually enhances national security to pay. Um, and it's the humane thing to do. And, you know, one of the things I found in my data is that, as I mentioned, you know, um, not negotiating, not paying doesn't seem to reduce the likelihood that Americans will be kidnapped, but it absolutely reduce, increases the likelihood that they'll be killed. So if you are Spanish and you are kidnapped, the data indicates, based on the last 12 years or so of data, that you have a 100% chance of being ransomed and coming home. If you are an American, you have about a 25% survival rate if you're kidnapped by a terror group. So that's a lot of people who died as a result of this policy. That creates a strong uh, argument that the policy must be effective if we're sacrificing lives, and I don't think that test is met. Right, and the, and the counterfactual and the very difficult to prove and test uh, uh, alternative is for everybody to say they're not going to be able to pay. Well, that would work perfectly, but, but a security specialist compared that to, like, let's wipe out armed robbery by making it illegal to give muggers your wallet. Right. <laughs> it just, yes, of, of course. Right. If nobody ever paid a ransom, the crime would disappear. But it's a coercive crime. Yes. It's, you know, it's, there's no way to, to, to wipe it out. So, you know, that, that, just, that just is a, you know, I think it's, 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 it's logical. Yes. But the Europeans uh, have done the math. They will pay. Companies will pay. Families will pay. So there's an economic incentive. And there's no way to eliminate the crime. So we can cross that one off our list. But, uh, in the, but in the process, then, you must be really elated that Donald Trump is the president of the United States because he has said he is willing to talk to anybody about anything. And he's proven yes. so in so you many know, you know, instances. So, so, so it's really interesting. I mean, I actually think that this is an area where um, it's complicated, but, 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 but Trump has done some good things. So the Obama administration was so focused, because this is Obama's nature, on the strategic considerations, mm -hmm. and they were legitimate, right? Yes. We, we have to reduce funding and cut off funding for terror groups that are attacking the United States, and we can't allow rogue states to imprison Americans and coerce us into changing our foreign policies. So those are completely legitimate goals, and but in the process of pursuing those strategic objectives, he kind of because he was so you know caught up in the policy that he lost track of the human and humanitarian needs. He lost track of the political consequences. One hostage you know counterterrorism expert said you know hostage taking is like political dynamite, right. and and I think that Obama felt that it would have been cheap to acknowledge that. And so he didn't engage with the human dimension of this problem. Trump, sort of like the French government, is sees the polit he's, he's, he is completely indifferent to the complex strategic complexities and the strategic considerations. He just sees the possibility of a political win for him. Yeah. And I actually just wrote about this. I did an um, an op-ed for the for the LA Times. He's got like twelve Americans, some held hostage by terror groups, some um, held by rogue states, have come home uh, under Trump, and the families of hostages are actually tell me that they 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 appreciate the engagement. But the question is, what is he giving up? What is he giving up? Because he's personalized and politicized um, hostage recovery to such an extent that it's sort of swung. In the other direction. I mean, I think I think it actually. I think I do. You know, I do commend him. Not. I think I do commend him for giving the issue attention and for bringing uh, people home. But I think that there's a tremendous risk when you personalize and politicize this process because, of course, he's gutted the State Department. He's gutted the NSC. There is no. Um, you know, expertise to inform the decision making, and I think that's inherently dangerous. Right, and we're seeing perhaps some of the uh, some of this danger, and not just the risks, but the costs, uh, very specific costs to our policies uh, yeah. being playing out right now, whether they be 
uh, North the, Korea, yes, North in Turkey, yes. Turkey. You know, with 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 the uh, uh, with the with the pastor who was yes. who was released. What what was France, we don't yes. we don't know what was given up in exchange. Was that was that part of the negotiation for the rapid uh, uh, withdrawal of um, of um, U.S. forces from 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 Sy from northern Syria? Right. Well, we don't know, but there certainly seems to be a correlation. Yes, I'm looking forward to whoever writes that memoir. Yes. To uh, <laughs> to inform us about yeah. what in fact yeah. uh, occurred. Yeah. Uh, you know, at this point, we try to take some photos, some um, photos. Well, yeah. I, I will you take photos, but uh, take yes, photos. take photos. Anybody who wants to. No, I'm uh, looking at three by five cards yeah. here okay. that have been distributed in the audience, and um, they have some specific questions, and 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 so, and I'm curious as well. Yeah. Can you talk? Uh, this is the question. Can you talk about the process? What happens when a journalist is taken hostage, the actions of both governments and organizations like CPJ. So it really is a mechanical question here. What you what know, and, and 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 you've already said that it, it's different. Of course, every case yeah. is very different. Well, but is there sort of anything that that you can? Yeah, point I to mean, that? absolutely. I mean, I, I can tell you one thing that's happened is this is you know I've been doing this for a long time and it's become you know much more professionalized. So. Um, you know, usually if it's a media organization, you know, you, 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 you will, they, so most, most media organizations um, have kidnapping and ransom insurance. This is supposed to be secret, but, you know, every major organization that has people operating in high-risk environments has this kidnapping and ransom insurance. And basically one of the things it does is it provides a professional negotiator and those, uh, and you s usually set up a, um, a kind of cell um, this, would, this is how it would work in a, in a, in a country where um, the government is less likely to be involved. And so you have a professional negotiator and then you have a, a crisis management team and, um, and then you sort of compartmentalize uh, and contain uh, the decision making and you rely on this expertise and you know, you'll try and make contact with the uh, kidnappers. And again, if, if, if the kidnapping is carried out by a criminal organization, uh, it's completely legal uh, to negotiate. It's legal to pay ransom, uh, and uh, the FBI will assist in that, and you will be reimbursed uh, by uh, through your insurance policy. And so, uh, as we look at the trends within the Western news m business, um, we're seeing fewer and fewer news organizations. Mm -hmm. In fact, as we sit here uh, last week, uh, about a thousand journalists yes. were laid off from their institutional yeah. uh, organizational yeah. structures, uh, and they included places like BuzzFeed News, for instance. Yeah. Um, so while perhaps the New York Times, or certainly the New York Times and some of the larger yeah. institutions have what is called KNR, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, kidnapping, kidnapping and ransom, and ransom. insurance. Yeah. Um, and perhaps in certain instances, or in many cases, are uh, training their journalists yes. uh, before they go out into the field, in particular in mm -hmm. conflict zones. What we're also seeing at the same time as a result of this change in the business model and the collapse of some of the institutional structures is this higher frequency and higher incidence of freelancers heading into the field who don't have yeah. the type of institutional support or insurance structures or even organizational yeah. support that... Uh, yeah, I mean... Is it all you? I mean, is yeah, it all yeah. falling on your shoulders? Is uh, that... Well, I mean, we've been, we, you know, we've become more involved in this in almost every way. Um, you know, we're not, we're not in the middle. You know, we're not, we're not, um, you know, uh, negotiators. You know, we're not in the middle of those sorts of instances. But you know, where publicity is helpful, you know, we play a role. Um, where you know, we provide support, we often help identify resources. Um, for for families that, that that need that kind of support, we sometimes you know can provide expertise to media organizations that 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 that, that need that kind of support. Um, but I mean, I, I, it's also important to sort of take a step back and make make a couple of other points. One, this is a pretty rare crime. You know, I write about it. In other words, the the kidnapping of Westerners as a coercive and fundraising strategy, if you will, and a and a political strategy by terror groups is rare. I write about it because, you know, it's something I've had to grapple with and because mm -hmm. it, it does, you know, have geostrategic implications and it does have implications in terms of funding for these organizations. But most kidnapping, the vast majority is criminal in nature and it targets nationals of the country you know where the kid, you know the, where the kidnappers are present. So it's not a transnational crime. And most journalists, you know, I sort of take a step back and talk about, you know, how does the information um, 
ecosystem work now? You know, and a lot of you know what we know about Syria or Iraq or Mexico um, or uh, Pakistan or Afghanistan or um, Venezuela, for that matter, which is of course in the news now. You know, these these are stories that are reported by local journalists, and then they're filtered through this media ecosystem, and eventually, you know, we consume this information. But we depend on these journalists, and if you again, if you look at the CPJ data and even the data around kidnapping, you know, they're the ones who are getting kidnapped. They're the ones who are most vulnerable. There are. You know, I f don't remember the latest data, but it's like several dozen Iraqi journalists and Syrian journalists, Syrian, who were kidnapped by the Islamic State. They were never recovered. They're, they're almost certainly dead. Um, there were families were paying relatively modest ransoms to get their loved ones back. Uh, so this is a crime, you know, I deal with it in the, in the book yeah. as, as, as a kind of transnational crime and it has a special dimension, but we also have to recognize that the reality of, of all of these attacks, all of the risk, it's primarily borne by the, by the local journalists and we depend on them for the reasons you described to keep us informed. Right. So if we're talking about something that's quite, you know, that, that isn't as big as some of the other challenges that are, uh, it's certainly real. In it's terms some, of numbers. Absolutely. Yeah, in terms of numbers. Yeah. I mean, we're then talking about arrests, yes. killings. I think we're, we're still in January when we're recording mm. this here in 2019. And I think before the end of this month, we've already got three mm -hmm. killings yes. internationally of, yes. of journalists. Um, you know, I think the... The only profession more dangerous in Mexico is being mayor than it is being journalist, <laughs> yeah. you know. And so, um, are uh, what are the other multiple risks that you? Because you're are the committee to protect journalists. So what is it you're protecting them from, or trying to well, to the, train them to protect themselves from? Yeah, I mean the risks are so myriad and 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 varied that you know you need a different strategy for different for different countries. I mean basically I mentioned you know, that record numbers of journalists in, 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 in prison around the world. When, when you have imprisonment, you're really confronting, um, y you know, authoritarian structures. So, so you're, you're, you're confronting um, a powerful state um, that's using repression to suppress information. And there are certain strategies that apply in those situations. Um, and then in where you have high levels of violence, you tend to have a weak state that's unable to you know, protect any of its citizens, maybe because there's an ongoing conflict or because there are additional power centers within the society. And there's a different strategy and a, generally a more complex strategy that you would uh, use in those situations. I mean, one of the things that we've also done at CPJ, recognizing you know, that certain kinds of advocacy are not gonna work with criminal organizations right. and terror groups, is we've developed a whole emergency response team and a whole emergencies program. And we're trying to push, you know, there's, there's been uh, some, some pretty, pretty significant changes in the way international news organizations operate in high-risk environments and the kind of systems they put in place to protect their people and the kind of training that they provide. But that has not trickled down to freelancers and certainly not to local journalists. So yeah. we're trying to take some of that knowledge and push it out to the most vulnerable uh, population so that they are, you know, have better information and support when they undertake these kinds of high-risk assignments. And we're also trying to, you know, re recognizing that advocacy isn't going to work in every situation, actually respond and uh, provide assistance, you know, so when, if we need to evacuate journalists or we need to support the families of journalists uh, who are imprisoned, you know, we do that. But, I mean, I think, you know, uh, this has been, this has been, you know, it, it inevitably, it's the nature of this work that there's, you know, there, there are tremendous challenges um, and, 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 and lives are at stake. And sadly, in my line of work, you know, I've seen too many people die. But I do think that there are some optimistic notes. And that is that I think... I, I'm ready for that. Yeah, I know. I'll bet. I'll bet. And I'm shifting the conversation. Thank you. Uh, which is that I do feel that um, people are becoming aware of what's at stake. I mean, even just the visibility that CPJ has compared to what we had a couple of years ago. Uh, it's because people in this country recognize that, you know, this freedom that we've taken for granted and, 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 and you know, the press is not easy to love in the United States, to put it mildly. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's really the fact that people feel, you know, that, that these, these essential defining principles are threatened um, 
that you know people are starting to respond and engage with this issue. And then around the world, you know, we talked a little bit about technology um, and how that's transformed the whole information infrastructure. And I think people feel invested in the technology itself and how they use it and 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 how they use it to connect. And so they are aware when their ability to um, to use the technology for those purposes is compromised. And then you have, you know, cases like the Khashoggi murder, and as bleak and dark as that was, I have never, never seen the kind of response. Uh, just the sense of outrage and, and disgust. And um, the mobilization, part of that had to do, you know, with the Washington Post. It's yes. obviously, uh, you know, a national uh, news organization with tremendous ability to, you know, to disseminate this information. It had to do with the role that Turkey played in kind of leaking out information bit by bit for its own purposes and keeping the story alive. Um, but I do think, you know, as, 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 as difficult as the circumstances are now and as challenging as these questions are, I feel very energized because I feel that people really are beginning to understand what's at stake. Right. I would add to the Khashoggi murder, murder the just absolute heinous and and uh, unbelievable circumstances uh, the, and yeah. the clinical circumstances under which the, yeah. he was killed. But yes, I mean, that all added, I think, to yes. this, uh, to identifying this as a unique moment uh, and one that really did mobilize not just the press, but also a public at large to exactly. be aware of, of these issues. Um, you know, we recently had an interview uh, on uh, the World Affairs conversation with Jason Rezaian. Yes. And who, too, now has a new book. Yes. And uh, talking about his. I haven't read the book. It, I know you should. It's, it's fairly, wonderful. Yeah, it just came out. And yeah. it is. Um, and he talks about his yes. captivity. Yeah. Anything you can. Yes, sort of, I can uh, in, tell the, you. in the context of yeah. your work and yes, your interests. Yes, absolutely. I, in fact, Jason and I are, are good friends. Um, I work to help get him out of jail so thank you that that was uh that was a bonding experience and got, got to know his, his his wonderful family and we actually did a book event together um we were we were um on uh reliable sources together and we talked about our books and i read his book and he's read my book um but what I'll, what i will say about jason uh and and i made this point to him is that he's free he was held by a um you know, a, 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 a rogue state, if you will. Uh, I mean, I guess you can, you can argue with that framing, but, you know, for the purposes of, you know, imprisoning innocent people as um, a coercive strategy in the context of the nuclear negotiations, I, I consider that rogue. And um, this was a, a government with whom the U.S. did not have diplomatic relations. And, you know, the, the Obama administration, who I've criticized the Obama administration, but let me give them credit in the um, Jason Rezaian case because they were very creative. They found ways of putting pressure on the Iranian government. And you know what they did? They made some concessions mm -hmm. to get him free. One of them was that um, some Iranians who were imprisoned in the United States, um, him and some of the other uh, Americans who were, were, were also unjustly imprisoned in Iran. I consider him a judicial, a judicial hostage is what I called him. And so they made some concessions and those concessions, uh, um, including the release, as I mentioned, of some, some Iranians who were imprisoned in the United States uh, on, on sanctions violation charges. And so why is it that when you're held by a rogue state, there are negotiations, there's concessions, within the context of national security. I mean, you, you, have to, you have to recognize that there are certain things you cannot do. And he's free as a result. And he had the support of the U.S. government at the highest level. Pre the president was directly involved, the secretary of state. Why is it that Americans, when they're kidnapped by a terror group, a designated terror group, are left on their own? Right. With no imagination, no engagement, no high-level support, that seems unjust and unfair. And that's actually one of the, you know, kind of the key points I make in my book is let's not get locked into some policy framework that was accidental. Let's look to each case as distinct. Let's be creative. Let's be resourceful. Let's find the way to keep national security in mind, but bring these people home.
Right. So um, I'm sure Canada is thinking about this right now as they're looking at some of their mm -hmm. non-journalists, but nonetheless mm -hmm. uh, individuals who yeah. are being held in uh, China. Sh uh, and and there, there are no concessions country, by the way. That's but, right. But yeah. not, this is, again, comes, does not apply to states. Yes. Uh, so we're watching that closely. And of course, it falls into this yeah. category yeah. outside. Of you know, I've got a few more questions yeah. here. Um, and it's uh, and so I'll just yeah. read. Uh, it says uh, one of them says uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, use private security form firms uh, yeah. when in high-risk regions. Is there a barrier to using these yeah. services for journalists, except maybe cost? Yeah. Well, I mean, the barrier is that journalists, to do their job, need to engage with people and talk to them, and they need to engage with vulnerable people if you want to get a variety of perspectives and. Um, uh, you, having an armed guard uh, <laughs> inhibits that. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a been real... my experience. Yes, certainly. it's yes. a really tough choice that yeah. journalists have to make. You know, some, in some environments, the risk is so great uh, that they have no alternative. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's always less than ideal. And, you know, what, what invariably happens in, in, in those situations, not invariably, but I've seen it happen, you know, okay, Somalia. Okay, so there were, there were journalists who were reporting in Somalia, and they were support, reporting basically surrounded by um, these armed private militias that they would hire. And the reporting honestly sucked because, you know, they were basically riding in the back of some technical looking out. You know, maybe they could interview some mayor, but they had no idea what was going on. Um, and then some freelance journalist comes in and says, okay, well, I'll bear the risk and to do some real reporting, and that goes wrong. That is, uh, yeah. Um, we've got a couple more questions. Sure. Uh, uh, I'm going to summarize them because there's a couple of them yeah. in this area. And, yeah. and it talks about um, multinational organizations or even transnational uh, partnerships. So whether it's the UN or right. CPJ working with organizations elsewhere, how does that coordinating uh, occur, uh, not strictly for the kidnapping issue, but also yeah. in the protection of journalists overall? So, you know, the, the, the UN has been a somewhat uh, reluctant ally. So if we're talking about the UN, um, you, know, we, we've, um, you know, we've engaged with the UN over the last three secretary generals um, and with other UN institutions, uh, such as the Human Rights Council and UNESCO, which is the uh, UN Economic, Social, and Cultural Organization, which actually has the press freedom portfolio. Which the United uh, States has now left. Correct. Um, not for, and that's the second time, by the way, they've left uh, UNESCO. Yeah. But um, the uh, but it's it's frustrating and it's difficult. Um, I mean, we're we're sometimes able to um, uh, uh, get uh, you know in, in statements of support from from the Secretary General, which which you know is valuable and sort of disseminates down mm -hmm. through uh, the bureaucracy and uh, the Reporters Without Borders, who are our colleagues, the French uh, press freedom yes. organization. Uh, and us, have, we've created a, um, uh, a, a kind of mechanism to work with the Secretary General's office and alert him uh, when uh, there are high-profile cases um, and we need their engagement. And you know, we've had some limited success with that. But I, I actually want to make a point, w which is you know, we've been extremely disappointed with the engagement around the Khashoggi murder mm -hmm. because we believe that a credible international UN-led investigation by the Secretary General is essential to achieving justice because, um, you know, the Turks uh, have certainly uh, released a, a lot of information that implicates uh, the Saudis, but they have their own motivations for doing so. And the, Turkey is the world's leading jailer of journalists, so whatever motivation they have, it's not defense of press freedom and independent journalism. Um, and of course, we have no cooperation from the Saudis, and um, you know we have a, a basically a show trial going on there. So we need the UN to engage, and the Secretary General has resisted. Uh, there is a, um, a special rapporteur, a UN special rapporteur on extrajudicial killing, uh, Agnes Calamar. She's uh, a very uh, formidable woman. Um, she's um, originally from France and uh, lives in New York now, and she is actually in um, Turkey carrying out um, an independent inquiry um, into the Khashoggi killing. So that, that is positive, but she's an independent special rapporteur. She's right. not part of the UN uh, bureaucracy. Uh, so we need, we need to see uh, engagement from the Secretary General um, 
and we're disappointed that we haven't seen it so far. Well, uh, one of the things that, uh, and maybe we can wrap up around mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. is, uh, so you, you should know, I, I write the foreign affairs column mm -hmm. for the I McClatchy do. chain. I, I do know, I've read it, it's great. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't fishing for compliments, <laughs> but thank you. Um, and um, one of those who has written for the McClatchy and has worked for McClatchy is someone who is on your lapel. Austin Tice. Austin Tice, and your lapel pin reads, Pound sign, right? Free, Hashtag free, free Austin Tice. Yes. And if you go to any of the McClatchy sites, you will yeah. regularly see Free Austin Tice. Could you talk just a bit yes. about him and, and his case and why he's so prominently displayed on your person? So Austin Tice is a freelance journalist. He worked for McClatchy and also for the Washington Post. Uh, he was on a reporting trip in northern Syria in August 2012. He'd been in the country for several weeks. He was, you know, he, he was doing some, some terrific work, but he was relatively new to journalism. He was a, a former a Marine. And he was at a checkpoint, um, and he was detained at that checkpoint. And he has not been heard from since. It's been, I'm in touch with his family. They remind me how much time has passed. Uh, so it's been six years, five months, and maybe 17 days now. Um, the family has had no um, communication from whoever is holding him. Uh, they don't know precisely who it is. There have been some reports in the media that it's you know, some, somehow linked to um, Syrian state security or some sort of government entity, but that's never been confirmed, and they've never, as I said, had any communication. Um, I talked to senior officials at the end of the Obama administration uh, who told me that they believed he was alive. Senior Trump administration officials have said the same thing. I believe he's alive. The family believes he's alive. And we all believe, and the family believes this very firmly, that the, the only way to bring him home is for the U.S. government to engage. Precisely how that engagement works, we don't really know because we don't know precisely who has him. But he's not going to come home unless the U.S. government thinks creatively and f tries to figure out some strategy that will achieve this. And the family believes that the only way to get them to engage is to keep his case front and center and to talk about it and to write about it and to discuss it in events like this. And that's why I'm wearing the lapel pin. Well, thank you. And if you go to any of the McClatchy sites, you will likely see that today is a very good day to free Austin Tice. Indeed. Um, uh, it's been great to have you here and to discuss uh, these, uh, these issues of journalism, uh, to look at your book, which I will repeat is we want to negotiate the secret world of kidnapping hostages and ransom joel simon is the executive director of the committee to protect journalists he's been doing it for 20 years he hasn't been the executive director the whole time but he's what has it been about a decade that you've been yeah, a little more than a decade it? and so um it is not easy work it is uh i think gratifying work when you are successful at helping not only release and get back some of the journalists, but also in the process of training and preparing my colleagues and me for uh, the difficult world of foreign corresponding, but also for those who are native in those various countries to be exposed and to learn about how to protect themselves. And uh, as you say, uh, you wanna return to that optimistic note before we close? <laughs> Yeah, uh, if, 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 if everybody, if, if, you're all much more aware yeah, about if every, this. If everyone is uh, is with me here, no, I, I mean, I, I do think, I do think that, you know, as, as again, as difficult as the as the, the environment is, I do feel we have a certain like wind at our back, and that is the public support and engagement and recognition of the important importance of this work. So. Um, you know, we live we live in a in a in a an environment in which the leaders and the governments that should be defending these principles are, are failing to do so, and that's having a very deleterious effect um, around the world. But I think there's an awareness of what's at stake and a recognition, you know, as as in this country certainly as. Um, critical as people are of the performance of the media, and and just you know speaking outside my CPJ role, I'll say a good chunk of that is justified. Uh, but you know what's at stake when when the, when the when the independent and free press is threatened, the very foundation of democracy is threatened, and um, and so you know we 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 have to stand up for these principles here, and we have to stand up for them because if we don't defend them in this country, then journalists everywhere are more vulnerable.
support your journalists, support <laughs> the Committee to Protect Journalists, and above all, support your democracy. Thank you very much, Joel Simon, for being here.